Hi, everyone, and welcome back to Open Your Eyes to the Universe. I'm Gabriel Martin, your host for this evening. If you're joining for the first time, let me tell you a little bit about Open Your Eyes to the Universe. It's a series of contemporary talks, conversations, meditations, and interviews with people who inspire and uplift others by sharing their wisdom, their insights and experiences to co-create a better world. And as we begin tonight in the spirit of reconciliation, the Universe team acknowledges the traditional custodians of our country throughout Australia and their connections to land, to sea and to community. And we pay our respects to the Elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples here today. And we also acknowledge and respect the wise Elder within us all and the collective wisdom of all those here this evening. Last month, we were with an experienced meditator, Maureen Cannon, and we we're talking about the power of prayer and meditation, practices that have provided a source of personal solace and well-being for centuries to many of us, and have been used as a collective power for social justice change for centuries as well. Maureen brought a very grounded, practical approach to our conversation on the power of meditation, its transformative power in terms of personal change, as well as its capacity to foster spiritual growth and manifest collective change. If you missed it, Jan will place the link in the chat so you can check it out later on. And here we are tonight, and we have the pleasure of the company of two educators, Namali Rodrigo and Hanna Weina. And we'll be taking up a conversation on the education elephant. Now, in case that sounds a little obscure, let me allow, let me just sort of um, elaborate a little bit on that. So it goes like this. There's an elephant in the classroom when it comes to supporting students to achieve their best during their formal schooling years. And it's this. While teacher and teaching quality are commonly addressed and pointed to as the number one factor in producing student outcomes, it's actually not. What the policymakers don't want us to know, and perhaps have even forgotten, is that teaching and teaching quality are only second in importance in the impact on our students. So what's the first? The first, perhaps not surprisingly, is socioeconomic status background. Yeah, that's right. It is, in fact, the wider social and life experiences of students, what they bring into the classroom, that are of greater importance in shaping and determining the outcomes of students' efforts or their lack of at school. So rather than shifting the blame from teacher to parents and wider public, revealing this not so little elephant creates an incredible opportunity to better support our young ones as they develop, as they express and experience their capacity and competence in learning and also in life. Because it means that we can all play a part in shaping the quality and experience of their learning. And we all know the wonders of collective impact. So tonight we'll be exploring these concepts and as always, we'll be casting a spiritual lens over it all. Namali Rodrigo has been working as an educator, principal and community development coordinator for over 20 years, while Hama Wena is a former high school teacher now working as a seasonal academic in the Masters of Education program at UNSW. Namali and Hannah, it's a pleasure to have you with us. A very warm welcome to both of you on Universe Tonight. Thank you so much. Love Thank to see you. you both. Yeah. <laughs> Can we get a shot of there we go? There we are. <laughs> and what about Namali? Where's Namali? Yeah, at the top there. And very oh, wonderful. That's great. Good to see both of you. So a very warm welcome to Universe tonight. And we've got an incredibly engaging and also big conversation. It's not a small one. It's probably as big as the elephant. <laughs> anyway, Namali, um, we're going to begin our conversation this evening with you. So let me introduce you to our viewers. Um, Namali has been working as an educator, a principal and community development coordinator for over 20 years supporting systemic changes in schools and capacity building programs that empower community-based organizations. Her NGO works across West Africa to provide greater access to opportunities for vulnerable people and has implemented several projects that support orphans, widows, 
refugees and internally displaced people, people with disabilities, and people living with HIV, with medical care, education, psychosocial support, and cooperative enterprises. She also supports service delivery and gender equity training for one of the largest women's networks in the region. And in Australia here, she's implemented several projects for First Nations, COL, that's culturally and linguistically diverse people, and refugee communities. It's a phenomenal breadth in terms of her career, and um, I think that could only happen with someone with a very generous heart and a very warm personality. And meeting Namalia, I really ha had that sense um, of the breadth of her and her passion for social justice. So Namalia, to begin, um, I want to just mention the OECD Programme for International Student Assessment which examines, uh, for our viewers, it examines what students know in reading, mathematics and science, and what they can do with what they know. And it provides the most comprehensive and rigorous international assessment of student learning outcomes to date. In 2018, the PISA identified that the performance differences across the OECD countries between the most socioeconomically advantaged and disadvantaged students is equivalent to over three years of schooling. Now, I find that alarming, Namali. What can you share with us about supporting students to achieve their best during their formal schooling years and some of the things that hinder this? Thank you, Gabrielle. And it's a, it's a pleasure to be here in the universe. So thank you for inviting me. And it's an honor to be with my sister, Hannah, as well. Uh, I want to let everyone know that I presently am on the, the Darug Nation uh, and I pay my respects to elders past and present. And I would also like to acknowledge the continuing connection our First Nations people have to this land, the sea, waters, the air, and all the traditions that are based around this land. And from my perspective, education is not just a process that happens within an institution, but it is any kind of transmission of knowledge that enables growth to occur in a person. And so for the learner, it's a lifelong journey of receiving, reflecting, and becoming. For many indigenous peoples from, from cultures all over the world, this transmission of knowledge is passed down through song lines, through art forms, through practical demonstrations, through spiritual rights, through mentoring and guidance from elders. And that education is grounded in connection with community, with environment and habitat, with heritage, and with a person's own spiritual essence. So it's a very holistic process, quite unlike the compartmentalized subjects and methods that we adopt in modern schooling and modern testing. So education traditions in most cultures involve uh, that as we educate ourselves, we expand, we apply, and we have an increasing responsibility to also mentor younger ones who come after us as well. So from my perspective, someone who may be uneducated in the institutional sense can still be educated through other traditional learning and becoming experiences. But what education in whatever form it takes is often very much deeper when it has meaning and connects people to each other and themselves. So I'd like to talk a little bit about what the elephant in the room is um, and then go on to talk about how we can support people um, that come from different socioeconomic backgrounds. Now, when we talk about the elephant in an educational room or a classroom, an elephant in a room is a general concept that is used for describing an obvious problem that no one is really talking about. So we often in education talk about investing in teacher quality or facilities to improve student outcomes. But we often ignore other salient drivers of learning. Now, I come from a Montessori philosophical position, uh, and I have also implemented a lot of education programs um, including a famous experiment called Sagartha Mithra's Hole in the Wall Experiment with street children. I've implemented this in a number of developing countries. And after working with thousands of learners in different parts of the world, particularly in Nigeria, where I was based 
for a long time, I've come to appreciate that learning occurs naturally in every child and can be facilitated by not just education degree holders that we call teachers, but really anyone who believes in a child, has positive expectations for the child and provides the context of genuine, consistent support and mentoring so that the child can inbuild motivation within him or herself. So real learning is often driven by an intrinsic process that occurs from a sense of purpose and meaning that a learner gives to a learning experience. And motivation can also emerge from being part of a group that is mutually encouraging. These factors of motivation are often related to socioeconomic context rather than teacher quality or facilities per se. So to unpack this idea a little bit more, I wanna introduce you to three learners I know personally, and we can talk about how they experienced a change in their educational outcomes. So Binta was a girl from a minority tribe in Northern Nigeria. This is a region that has over 20 million out of school children. This is the highest number of any country in the world out of school children. The public school system in Nigeria has virtually collapsed due to corruption and mismanagement. Schools look like they've been in a war zone. There are potholes in the classroom floors. Sometimes you see ceilings have collapsed as well. Broken doors, broken windows, very uncomfort uncomfortable archaic benches. Classrooms can be so overcrowded that you may have 130 to 170 students in a single classroom. And the classrooms are smaller than the classrooms we have in Australia. Teachers are often not paid for months and so many don't even come to work. So many of these children are abandoned in schools. Now in 20, 2019, my team went to public schools in three states of Nigeria to identify intelligent junior high school girls and admit them into what we call the gifted scholarship program. Gifted stands for girls identified for training, education, and development, so G-I-F-T-E-D. And the gifted program was all about socioeconomic equity. We placed the girls into functional private schools. We provided weekly mentoring and extra lessons for them in whatever subjects they enjoyed and they wanted to pursue. We gave them regular personal development and leadership training. We introduced them to outstanding women leaders and role models. We sent them to excursions across the country to broaden their life exposure. We basically gave them all the opportunities usually available to children of the wealthy in the country. And after they graduated from school, uh, we sponsored them into university as well and postgraduate school if they wanted to pursue postgraduate studies as well. We also got them placements for work experience. And because we brought them together very often, they became like a family and we became their family as well. And so with those strong connections and mutual support, they were able to go very far in their studies. Binta's family also stood behind her and that was a really important critical success factor I felt because they shared her vision. Binta was very headstrong, she was a feisty young thing and she was determined to become a role model herself. She worked hard, she became a registered nurse and just earlier this year we celebrated that Binta was posted to the Nigerian Customs Service into a high ranking leadership position. She's got a very high salary now. And I'm sure she'll do very well for herself with her determination. Now, conversely, we had a young girl called Fatim. Fatim was also identified for the gifted scholarship program. She came from a nomadic tribe and she was the first in her family to even go to school. She lived with only her mom, who was no longer with her father. And our team visited her mother, as we do with all our gifted girls. We visit the family and we provide material support to enable the, the family to permit the girls to go to school so that there's no economic pressures that the girls will face. However, Fatima dropped out of our program because she had no intrinsic motivation to pers persevere with modern schooling. She couldn't really connect the curriculum to her lifestyle as a nomad, as a nom part of a nomadic community. And she didn't have the community around her to really encourage her. 
So within a few months, she dropped out and all our appeals uh, did not, were not successful. The next year, we we're trying to uh, embark on a new strategy with a new education project targeting 60,000 out of school students, including nomadic students. And we are going to this time co-design the educational program so that the curriculum, the scheduling, the operations, everything is co-designed and driven by the community so that the children involved can have community support around them and they can achieve their personalized learning goals rather than uh, a curriculum imposed upon them from an external authority. Now, the third case I'd like to talk about is Ade. Ade was a boy discovered sleeping under a bridge in the southern, southern part of Nigeria. He was abandoned by his family, uh, his father in particular, at a young age, and he lost his mom in 2019. He was then placed into an aunt's care in her home, but he experienced abuse inside the household, and so Ade ran away and started living under the bridge with other homeless young people. Now, Ade was uh, a survivor, and so he found a way to earn a little bit of money through being in what in Lagos is called a bus conductor. And bus conductors um, are, are people that uh, hang in the doorway of a little mini bus that is jam packed with passengers. While the bus is moving, they hang in that doorway, calling out the names of all the bus stops. And as the passenger is getting off the bus, they collect the transport fare from passengers. So this is what Ade was doing just to put a little food in his mouth every day. In 2021, Ade was enrolled in what's called a chess in slums program, where volunteers came to the kids under the bridge every weekend to teach them how to play chess. And through that chess game, they were able to chat with the kids about their lives. And soon chess tournaments started taking place under the bridge and Ade became a champion chess player. The volunteers for this program were all in their 20s and tech savvy. They became like mentors to the kids under the bridge and they would share their videos and, and photos on social media. And those photos went viral. I think we even had a case where Paris Hilton retweeted uh, one of the photos as well. So through social media, funds were raised to send Ade and some of the other kids back to school. And Chess and Slums volunteers also established a foster care home so that champion chess players could be in a home, a household, taken care of by very supportive guardians and given access to things that many children take for granted, including laptops, healthy nutrition, um, and access to a wide support network. Right now, Ade is doing really well at school and he wants to become a fashion designer. And I'm very sure that he is on his way to fulfill that dream because it's led from within himself. So what does this mean for supporting education for every child? For me, it means that we can create a supportive community that has high expectations for children, but also supports the internal and external challenges that they face, particularly if they come from socioeconomic backgrounds that are disadvantaged and also backgrounds that are marginalized. But that support can go, go a long way in helping a child to believe in him or herself. Mentorship programs also help. We have an organization here in Australia called the RAISE Foundation, which I have been privileged to volunteer with as well. And the RAISE Foundation makes a tremendous impact in the life types of children who are called at-risk kids in schools. RAISE trains volunteers, sends them to schools for a 10-week period to support one child each. So it's a one-to-one -one mentorship. And that makes a world of difference to, to be uh, for a child in that situation of uh, disadvantage and perhaps even isolation, to know that there is somebody that they can count on every week to come to school and spend an hour with them and who's coming just to be there for them for no other reason than to be by their side. That alone makes an impact on these kids. It also for us means that supporting learning programs that are community led, community driven and incorporate deep, deeply meaningful connections for a child within their community to have a sense of belonging within that community 
and to build resilience within themselves, confidence and self-belief also goes a long way. So for me, um, it's important for us to not just see that elephant in the classroom, but also to be able to nurture that elephant as well. Thank you so much for letting me speak on this topic. Wow, Manali, that's um, that's so almost breathtaking in terms of, um, you know, the breadth that you've uh, introduced us to here in terms of this elephant in the classroom. And I mean, I've been appreciating the wholeness that you bring to education, that, you know, it's the whole child, the whole person and what's of intrinsic value to them. I think that came through very strongly um, in terms of listening to what you had to say. Hannah, is there something you'd like to comment on? Um, yeah, I think for myself, there were a few things that jumped out. Similar to you, Gabrielle, this holistic approach was very, um, it was a very apparent theme across what you were saying, Namali. But interestingly, even though we're talking about socioeconomic status as sort of the wraparound environment, what you were actually speaking to was the social environment that seems to make the strongest difference. Like throw as much money at it as you want, but if there isn't like the the example of the two girls in the gifted program, right? One had that, both had the the sort of um, the economic opportunity provided, but then one had the social support and one did not. And that was the delineator between their, um, their, their connectedness even to that opportunity. You know, like it's very interesting the degree to which people recognize an opportunity for its future, like the future potential that an immediate opportunity can provide one with. Um, but for these girls, that that social support seemed to be the delineator. And also that beautiful phrase you use of, um, in terms of, I couldn't quite phrase his name properly, but the young boy, um, that he's a success. Ade. Ade. Yeah. Okay. Ade. Um that his success is because it's led from within himself. And that I think there's a lot of depth to that. Um, and even if we go down even more than a sort of uh, psychology into the place of psyche and spirit and soul, there's a lot around what education allows people to recognize of themselves and their own potential and what it can switch on in terms of motivating a person to then bring out more of themselves into the world and be more fully fleshed as a human being, not fully fleshed, but um, one of my favorite phrases, I'm sure I've <laughs> used it before around both of you, but this idea of being more fully human, being a more fully expansive and expanded version of oneself. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. It is a process of becoming after all, that's what education is all about. In so many traditions, historically and in the present. So anything that facilitates that process of becoming for a child um, is an education, it has a transformative impact on that child. Mm. Uh, but often, you know, our education environments are quite stifling mm. and can be quite demoralizing. Uh, they can have a, a construct of achievement that doesn't necessarily, you know, uh, uh, reinforce the idea of becoming uh, a whole person, uh, a better person, a kind person, a connected person. Um, and so sometimes kids switch off. They, they're they not motivated anymore to be part of that whole framework, that whole system, and who can blame them? Mm. Uh, because they're not acknowledging the whole system that they are. Mm. Yeah, and, and exactly. exactly. And I'd really I, like to um, congratulate you, Namali, in terms of Fatima's story that you didn't try to, I mean, you, you tried to keep her engaged, but, you know, you developed a, a program, you co-created a program that would work for nomadic children, uh, nomadic girls, rather than insisting that she persevere with um, a system that just wasn't speaking to her, or her reality of, of who she who she essentially is. She just wasn't going to make that mold. And and I it was a sense of congratulations that I felt when you and your team thought, right, that's that. We're going to do it differently and started to explore what that difference would be um, in education that would bring her in and and give her a fair go, actually, at, at, at it. Um, I think that's Gabriella. also a really important aspect as an educator, isn't it? Like, 
not putting resources in, but changing, changing the approach to education when um, it quite obviously isn't, wasn't working for Fatima um, as it did for for um, Binte. It, it worked for her, but not for Fatima. So, yeah. Absolutely. I, I really believe in flexible approaches to education mm. um, and community-driven, personal-driven driven education. I think we're going to see a lot of changes within the next five to ten years. Uh, as people challenge what's happening systemically around education um, and creatively adapt uh, educational methods and content to suit you know who they are and who they'd like to become as well. So I think it's an exciting space to to work within. Such a different approach, isn't it? Who they are and who they want to become rather than IQ <laughs> or even EQ, you know, but who they are and what they want to become. I mean, it's so different, isn't it? Thinking about an education system that works in that way, that starts from that um, that tenant. Mm. Well, it's we know all the biases of IQ tests and you know a lot of these <laughs> measurement uh, examinations uh, really just assess how well are you at doing this particular examination um, according to the examiner's rules. Uh, but they don't necessarily you know, quantify a person's ability or uh, uh, where they're going to go with their life. They can do so much. We know of so many dropouts who have achieved wonderful things. And they're brilliant people. Uh, so I think mm. there's a lot to be said about how we measure uh, student outcomes as well and a student achievement. Mm. Mm. And three really good examples. I think it demonstrated it really well in terms of what this elephant in the room, in the classroom is. Um, and it's nothing like stories, I think, to to really learn. And it's, it's a great way of, um, I think it's a great way of teaching, actually, is stories, storytelling. And, um, yeah. So thank it's you for It's been tried and tested for thousands of years. <laughs> it's, 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 <laughs> Well, it's a very real approach, and um, it's, it's interesting, approach. isn't it? Because you can be, you can be sitting when you can remember something. a story. Yeah, yeah, you can be listening to something for you know an hour, and what do you remember? Or what do I remember? The story. I remember the story. Yeah, yeah. 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 Interestingly, okay. there was a Sugata in the a Sugata Mitra's hole in the wall experiment from 1999. Is something I passingly mentioned, but in that experiment, Sugata Mitra was a computer scientist in in India. Uh, he had his office building in Delhi, and he noticed that there was a, a walkway, a sort of pathway outside the walls of his complex where children in slums used to walk past. And he decided to just insert a computer into that wall that was connected to the internet. And within one day, those kids, through just trial and error, were able to access the internet and start browsing. <laughs> And uh, mm. then after some time, he started installing other software and so on. And the kids taught themselves. Uh, they just fiddled around and they were talking among themselves as peer-to-peer -peer sort of learning. Um, and they were able to learn a lot without any teacher. So it and, says a lot about children's innate abilities. They are already inquisitive. They already um, are interested in learning. They're already as Maria Montessori would say, they be, they start off life as sponges, you know, absorbing everything mm -hmm. from their environment. And they have sensitive periods or where they are, pay more attention to different things. Um, and so when you provide a supportive context, they can actually learn even without uh, a master's degree holder in the classroom. Um, and a second sort of very environment was to have these kids in a room where they had access to different uh, computers connected to the internet, but they had these virtual grandmas also uh, come in. And these were grandmas from different countries around the world who were not tech savvy. They had no idea what these kids were learning, uh, but they just said, oh, wow, what are you doing now? Can you tell me about that? And they just provide real encouragement. Uh, no judgment, just encouragement and support. And, and he found that the kids actually accelerated in their learning uh, when they just had that kind of environment around as well. So really interesting experiments. Yeah. Really powerful, isn't it? It's a really powerful, it's a powerful experiment and a powerful outcome. Yeah. And just Very to to flavor that even further, the things that he had in, installed on the computer, I can't remember the exact to topic, but we're talking kind of like 
um, astronomical physics kind of degrees. It wasn't a yeah. uh, simple maths equations or topics that these kids were, they were picking up the language, they were using it effectively, they were explaining it to each other. And for me, what that yeah. speaks to is not just that they can teach themselves, but that we grossly underestimate the capacity of a human being, full stop. Yeah. At every age, we do it with our elders, we do it with our young ones, we do it with ourselves. And I think that, <laughs> if I'm going to name a same, same, but different elephant, it's that, you know, that we don't actually recognize how astronomical the capacity of human beings are yeah. and like how much wasted potential there is within every one of us. Absolutely. We are expansive creatures. And uh, there's no end to how much we can expand if we're just given the right support uh, and environment to allow us to do that expansion. It comes from within. Um, mm. So when it's suppressed, it's suppressed. But when it's enabled, when it's facilitated, then we can do wonders. And the power of a supportive environment. The, the yeah. grandma is just getting on oh, and yeah. saying, how did you do that? Oh, yeah. You know, just the power of a supportive environment. Yeah. Look, we're going to push pause here. Um, it, it, you've brought up some beautiful and deep concepts and very clearly too, and very, with a lot of insight, Namali. Um, and we'll move to Hannah in a moment. But just before that, let's dive into a meditation together. Would you like to? Yeah, we'll do that together. Um, we're going to do a canned commentary, and it's called Keep a Calm Perspective, and it's off an album called Today I Will, by Carmen Warrington. And it's the kind of meditation that I suspect could be useful in all classrooms, particularly if they're a very, you know, the regular kind of classroom where there's definitely an elephant in the room. Um, and uh, and this might be a source of inspiration and solace. At least it speaks to the being within rather than um, a very external kind of instructive knowledge base. So, um, over to you, Pete. Let's move into this meditation together. Today I will, and it's called Keep a Calm Perspective. Today I will keep a calm perspective. Imagine your body is like a cloud, insubstantial, misty, ethereal, as light as air. It's as if you're no longer solid flesh and bone, you're made of mist. so light that you could float. Imagine being released from gravity's hold, feeling lighter than a feather or a butterfly. Feeling so light that nothing could keep you earthbound. Imagine up above you, a secret passageway in the ceiling, leading directly to the open sky. You're feeling lighter than air. Let yourself go and begin a gentle journey upwards. Enjoy the sensation of rising and leave today behind you as you float up and up and out 
into the open air. Keep floating higher. Rise above all the buildings, above the treetops, and continue to float higher. Rising upwards. Leaving everything behind you for a little while. Light and free. Far down below you, tiny cars are slowly making their way along little roads. Houses and buildings so small beneath you. Your concerns and worries seem to be far away in the distance as you continue to travel upwards. Just above you, there are thick clouds. A wind blows clearing the way for you to travel through. Pass through layers of white haze and come out above the clouds into a perfect blue sky. Into the realm of continuous sunshine. Bring yourself to stillness. Remain here, floating in an expanse of sunny blue sky. So much space around you. Below you is a carpet of white cloud, like snow. Above you, all around you, is the limitless sky. You've left your worries and concerns behind you. You've risen above the clouds to a place where the sun is always shining. Feeling calm and peaceful. No restrictions. No boundaries. No shadows, just light and space. Stillness all around you. Restoring stillness to your mind. You've reconnected with your inner peace. And now you are ready to continue your day with a calm perspective. 
Prepare for your gentle return journey. Approach the carpet of white cloud below you and let yourself slip down through the hazy white layers down towards the earth below you. Waft slowly down like a falling feather dreamily down, enjoying the journey. Drifting back down towards trees and rooftops. Pass through the secret passageway in the ceiling and slowly drift back down to where you started and reunite with your body of flesh and bone. Feel your limbs. Feel your fingers. Your tongue. Your closed eyelids. Remember that you can leave your worries and go above the clouds where the sun is always shining. And when you are ready, very slowly, open your eyes. I have um, one or two teacher friends in New Zealand who use these types of meditations in the classroom and um, has a really powerful and positive impact on the children and also the young people. Um, I guess it's being able to use, you know, the power of your mind to frame your experience and perhaps even bring a sense of relief into, into your school day in a very structured environment. Yeah. Anyway, we've been talking with Namali and um, and she's uh, led us into a great conversation around this elephant in the classroom. And now I'm going to bring in Hannah Weiner. So let me just give you a little bit of a sense of who Hannah is. She's a former high school teacher now working as a seasonal academic in the Masters of Education program at the University of New South Wales, where she's also completing her PhD exploring pre-service teachers' professional agency. Hannah has been a student and facilitator of Raj Yoga Meditation since 2003, and she's both deeply fascinated and passionate about the world we can create when we create a different quality of structures in our mind. Hannah, the World Bank Human Development Report, <clears throat> excuse me, in 2018, stated that there's a global learning crisis that amplifies educational inequalities that severely hobbles the disadvantaged youth who most need the boost that a good education can offer. So I'm wondering if you could unpack the impact of socioeconomic status and background on producing student outcomes and what you can share with us about this elephant in the classroom. So firstly, thank you for the lovely introduction. I um, I found myself giggling because, as I'm sure many of us know, we sometimes write these bios <laughs> and then forget how we framed it. And I'm like, oh, is that how I <laughs> wrote it? It's quite sweet. Um, I'm actually going to ask you to ask your question again, because I know the quote that you're referring to. Um, I had anticipated... I guess, attending to other matters of the topic and um, springboarding in strong connection to what Namali was talking about, but a different aspect or kind of, you know, maybe the tail, if not the nose or the trunk of the elephant. So can you say your question for me again? And I can see if I can attend to it more closely. Actually, I'm, I'm more intrigued about what you were going to say. So we can hold this question off if you like to later on. And it's something that I can pitch to both you and Namali. Yeah. But why don't you lead in with some of the things that you were wanting to say? Let's let's listen to that. Okay. So I think the thing that what I'd love to do is um, 
I guess just the, the disclaimer really is that rather than, than a very linear series of ideas, what I have is a series of aspects of this topic. And I'm going to speak to them in an order that's perhaps organic to the, the conversation as it's unfolded. And I think where I it feels most pertinent to start, and hello to everyone who's watching and listening and joining this, um, and of course to acknowledge that I come to you from Gadigal country and I'm very honoured and fortunate to be able to walk among the spirit of this land and the elders who are custodians of the spirit of this land and everything that it has gifted. People who live in Sydney, I think much magic grows here. Um, so an acknowledgement of that. Um, this idea of growing things. And Namali has spoken very much to these uh, examples that come from very structured education programs. The gifted program, the chess champions. I, I know I've mispronounced, got the name wrong, but you know what I'm referring to. And, you know, there's young change agents in Australia who do great work um, helping young people design, think their own ideas and be the change agents for society. There's a There's like myriads of ground uh, sorry, of grassroots programs. But I think what it leaves for me, as per your introduction, Gabrielle, it leaves this very big question around, well, what can I do, right? What is the social, how can I contribute to that social environment, to the fabric of society in a way that I am contributive? Um, I don't know, as a lawyer or an accountant, or whatever, we're all around young people all the time. Um, and so I think I want to speak to that a little bit first. Um, it's interesting for me that when we think about what education is, the idea is framed very much through our own experiences of formal schooling, whether that, you know, primary all the way through to tertiary or anywhere less than that based on our life choices and opportunities and things like that. Um, so our own experiences, but it's also then framed by what that system is set up to and prioritizes for us. Um, and as Namali said, it prioritizes a certain uh, basket or it places emphasis on certain achievements as being getting an education. Um, What's really interesting, though, that Namali also said is that our experience, and it came up in our discussion, our experience of education as something of a lifelong journey of becoming means that the concept of education itself we can look at with a much more holistic view. And, you know, in the tradition of education philosophers, or I should say the philosophy of pragmatism used by educational theorists, the ideas that we apply to life can only be described as true if they really map to the fullness of our experience of them, right? And so one of these theorists, and I think I actually mentioned this the first time I had the fortune of talking with the, the listeners of this podcast, there's a, an educational theorist called Gert Biesta. He's contemporary, he's still writing, publishes, I don't know how he publishes so much, but he's amazing. And in a very uh, practical way, he says there are three domains that we can think about educational purpose and outcome. One is the sense of qualification. What does an education in a formal sense and qualify us to know and be able to do? What skills does it provide us with? The second is socialization, meaning how does it enable us to function within a social setting and know how to work with others and um, understand the cues and the, the processes of, yeah, engaging with others in our work and in our lives. And the third that he attends to is this, the, the, the bit within that we've been talking about, that subjectification. How do I become a subject of my own life? How do I allow my own personhood to flourish? And if we're to think that formal schooling at present really takes takes care of the qualification and socialization, I think where everyone can step in is in that bit around acknowledging and enabling unique personhood of young people to flourish. It's very interesting that, I, I know that's all to some degree very highbrow theory, but 
the importance of thinking and reframing what we even think of education as being and being very clear on it in our minds. It comes down to like, you know, change processes and how we enable to, let me start somewhere else. With an analogy, if you're going to change the wheel on a car, it helps to understand the process of that wheel, the system of that wheel, and not to maybe try and slash the tires and peel them off. You know, it helps to know that they're bolted or nutted on, not a car person, but go with it, you know, to, to unscrew the nuts first, or actually to, to jack it just high enough so that the wheel's touching so it doesn't spin, and then take the bolts off, and then do no cars, <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> um but if we don't know that process, one of two things is going to happen. We're either going to try and change it in a way that causes damage, and then we've lost the entire tire, and it cannot be mended or repumped or anything like that. Or so we're going to cause harm, or the wheel's going to spin, and we're not going to be able to do it at all, or we're not going to be able to change it as effectively as we could, right? So there are these two aspects of, I kind of framed it quite nicely for myself earlier, we're not going to be able to change things for the better. And we're not going to get better at changing things. So if we're talking about attending to, say, equity gaps or, yeah, if we're talking about equity gaps and socioeconomic and social environments for young people, we need to have an understanding of the system and process of education that enables us to do these two things more effectively um, most people, I, I know you've seen it, Gabrielle, but over the last 20 years, regardless of socioeconomic status, the learning, the PISA outcomes of the last 15 years have demonstrate parallel declines between the highest SES, I'll go that way for people looking, highest SES and lowest SES have been in consistent decline in PISA results across all OECD countries for the last 20 years. Um, that means it doesn't matter how much money you have. We're fundamentally not attending to certain bits of this system or they're only measuring parts of the system and there are other being, systems that aren't being represented, sorry, other parts of the system that aren't being represented in that graph. So if we want to attend to equity, if we want to improve learning opportunities for everyone, if we want to bake in a sense, then for me, I think thinking through these three lenses of qualification, socialization, and subjectification gives us a framework to talk with. And then what we can do is go, right, how can I contribute to that? So again, if, if qualification and socialization are kind of taken care of in the formal setting, then raising the bar on enabling young people to be their own unique selves as something that is equally important as doing well in their tests, as um, learning to not bully, to not vape, <laughs> you know, all these sorts of things that go on in schools, um, learning how to be cooperative with teachers when they ask something of you rather than just, just be obstructive, understanding why a teacher might be asking something of you um, rather than just feeling controlled by the system. All of these things, understanding that the way I show up as a person is as important an outcome is something that every single one of us can, I think, attend to in how we communicate with the young people in our immediate orbit around why education is important and what we hope for them. Um, not asking people to cooperate because it was what you're supposed to do or what I told you, socialization, but because there is more that you can become. And if you do this, there's a subtle mechanism that might inspire other people to be more cooperative with you encouraging people as Namali did rather than demanding things of people. Um, and in terms of like very practical things, I think when we think about the, I know I'm, again, I'm talking to a lot of different parts of the picture here. When we think about education as a much more holistic endeavor, then it becomes quite nonsensical that learning outcomes are solely on the shoulders of teachers. 
it's impossible, right, that they are the only ones who are responsible for all of these three things, especially this bit of subjectification. Um, within initial teacher education, I, yeah, I've been really, really astounded. Now that I'm actually working in this space, I'm astounded at the quality and rigor that in Australia, in the context that I'm familiar with, which is UNSW, which I acknowledge is one of the higher um, grades of um, teacher education in our country. So I'm very, very fortunate and honored to be working there. But I, I've been blown away by the degree of rigor that new te sort of incoming teachers, um, what they go through in their professional learning to become teachers, like, you know, critical analysis of education policy and understanding the entire context of their working environment. This is not a get in the classroom and tell kids what to do kind of thing. It is intensive and rigorous and demanding and um, expects a lot. But for us to then think that teachers are the responsible for that whole package of a person becoming a person and learning that as a mechanism of their life, it's nonsensical. I am. Um, so I think what there are, are three things that we can all do, really. Um, and in no particular order. I think one thing we can do is just, by the by, it was very interesting to me that I just happened to um, speak with my mother briefly before we came online. And um, in the way of things, life dropped a little gem in my hand. She, I was sort of doing the, mommy, come and join us moment. <laughs> uh, I hope you, hi, mom, <laughs> if you are with us. <laughs> um, she said she'd just recently listened to a podcast where someone had commented that the person presenting had commented that in sort of a, a post-truth, post-ish Trumpian world, all that stuff, um, people have become very, adults as well, have become very fixated on their opinions. So very fixated on being right and, and very inflexible, rigid. And I can understand that to some degree, you know, there's a degree of safety, psychological safety and feeling that we're right. You know, it's kind of like if, yeah, it's just that it's psychological safety when you can be sure of what you can be sure of, right? Not another thing that is up in the air for you to try and navigate. Um, but what this person said was that the consequence of that was a loss of curiosity. We've shut down curiosity because the fundamental process of curiosity is constant change. If you're curious, you're opening things up and you are re-examining your own understanding in light of something new again and again. And if you're a particularly curious person, you're kind of addicted to, to kind of like learning and change, right? And I can understand that in a world where things are quite chaotic or overloaded, you, you just want to shut that down. But what it's doing is socially setting up an environment, a social environment where curiosity is not role modeled to young people. That sponge like factor that Montessori systems have, um, I guess, emphasized and held on to as a critical learning factor, right, has been shut down by us. How are you ever going to support a young person? in terms of what they're bringing into the physical classroom, how are you gonna support their learning if all they see around them is um, dogmatic positioning among adults and very sort of uh, loggerhead conversations rather than curiosity. Okay, so I, I realized that what you just said um, in contrast, so I realized what you just said was very much in conflict with mine or actually that was a response to something else. It wasn't a response to what I just said. What made you say that? bringing a, a curiosity and a, and a bridge building to our conversations with each other sets up a sociocultural environment where curiosity is something that they can just subtly start absorbing. Even, even the, even the psyche, you know, the quality of our thinking produces the atmosphere that young souls learn to vibrate and sort of like frequency with, right? <laughs> Their freak, their, the frequency of their inner life is cultivated by what we cultivate as the ground, as that soil for them to flourish in. Um, there's a, Namali touched on this actually, but there's a great term, it's called enculturation. And I think I may have even mentioned it before, but um, 
there's a whole book on around the cultures of thinking and the social forces that we must master to truly transform our schools. It's a book by Ron Rickart, who is a, a sort of project head at Harvard for the Graduate School of Education there. Um, but he does, he talks about enculturation and that the quality of an individual's thinking is a result of the, um, yeah, that sort of sociocultural thinking environment that they are raised within. So one is, I think we need to be brave enough to turn on our curiosity again. And I can say even, I think that means we have to get curious about who the heck we are as people and allow ourselves to evolve and not think that now that I'm adulting, this is what adulting is like and I have to continue it like this. Like, Allow ourselves to take brave steps of self-transformation. Like, Can you imagine what it must be like or what it would be like for a young person to watch an adult, a significant adult figure in their life, go through processes of genuine, organic, and heart-centered transformation in their own life. Like, like what an extraordinary proposition. I would, I would be, I would love to watch that happen, you know, and I think we all are. We are all inspired when we watch people in our lives transform. I can think of actually someone I know. He was um, came to Australia as a refugee when he was a child from Ukraine, Ukraine Russia. I don't know exactly where, my bad. Um, started uh, in accounting, like we're talking paper bag, anxiety on the floor, nothing, you know. And I've watched it. And then he went into teaching, um, starting up a Latin dance school. And over the last, I'd say, five years, I've watched an entirely different human bloom in this man, and I continually affirm it to him. It, Even when I dance with him, you can feel there's a whole different being that has become. It's so much more that's come out of him. It's extraordinary, and it's it, it shows you what's possible for anyone of any age, right? The second thing I think we need to do, and I'll touch on this very briefly, is to think in processual terms. I think if we think of ourselves, of education, of socioeconomic status, of equity, any of these terms in very fixed sense, we are shutting down the lived reality that they are a process. Education is a continual, ongoing, it is life. It is life and it's ongoing and iterative. Um, equity and education, they are localized um, processes. If you think about them almost in terms of the dynamic equilibrium environment where the different components of that environment are constantly working with each other to keep the system as a whole in balance when you stand on two legs you're actually continually doing this and try it next time you stand up just go very still and just notice the very um within um what's called contact impro they call it small dance there's this very subtle almost imperceptible continual readjustment that you're doing to keep yourself upright, to keep yourself. So balance is not a static state. Balance is different weights in concert with each other, right? Think of like a, a rolling pin with a thing, with a ball, right? It's a constant motion thing. Um, so we need to think in processual terms. And I think what that does is, is allow us to map to realities of what's going on to think systemically and broadly for, you know, Namali and her team to recognize that we can't take a one size fits all approach. We have to adjust this and co-design even as the process that's going to enable us to better understand what nomadic students or students from nomadic um, communities, what they need and will be responsive to. You have to dance in concert with young people. And beautifully, I will say, because I'm a big advocate of, of Montessori, um, it's not a very well-known or understood system because it's just sort of alternative education and very often people will dump students in alternative spaces. But it's a very sophisticated system of thinking about and understanding how people grow. And they have a, they, one of their core principles is to follow the child. doesn't mean that the teacher does nothing but it means that you have a heightened attention to what the child, the student, the person, the adult that you are in conversation with, what is it that they're telling you through their successes and through their failures and how can you respond to that in a way that helps encourage them forward in their learning? So again, processional terms, know how the tire goes on, so how you can best change it when you need to. Um, 
And maybe that's a process, again, of being curious about what's really going on here that enables us to then respond more effectively. And the last thing I'll actually share is something I learned from one of the students that I was visiting. So this is a pre-service teacher on placement in, to be honest, I can't remember which school, um, although I want to say Matraville Sports. Yeah, so she's someone who has recently done a placement at Matraville Sports High. Um, you know, not not the easiest of schools to do a placement in, a 30, 30 to 35% identified um, in the First Nations population. So there's more that who choose not to identify because what should it really matter? Um, and what the student taught me was she has a framework for how she builds rapport with her students. Three words. They have to know that you know them, that you notice them, and that you like them. And these speak to so beautifully how we might create, I think, anyone. I would go so far as to say parents to their children because we we assume that the kid gets that I love them or that the teacher gets that, you know, or even our friends. Do our friends know that, well, maybe friends, we know who they are, but what do we notice about them? We're attentive to them and that we like them. And I think if we can bring these three aspects, I'm gonna to have to email her and say, <laughs> tell her how far that little gem of hers is gonna go because I think this is something that every single one of us can use as a framework to bring, to bring a richer quality of connectedness of that social connectedness that Namali spoke to as being so like a critical success factor really for young people to feel belonging, connectedness, supported, encouraged, the vi virtual grandma, don't even need to be my grandma, just someone saying, yep, oh, great, yep, cool, interested, I'm interested, and keep going, is enough to just help a young person do what they know how to do already, and then we can get out the way and not feel like we have to work even so hard to change everything, because it's it's a it's a healthy system. It's kind of like, you know, naturopathy, we just have to set the right systems in place for the, for the body to heal itself, it knows what to do, <laughs> um, and then we don't have to work so hard fixing all the problems we've made. <laughs> Some great points in there, Hannah. Thank you. I, I love your three, you know, your three key messages there. And I'm also a little um, uh, thinking about this term subjectification. And uh, it's not a word that I naturally gravitate to. Maybe I've got an, another association of it. But I think really what you're saying there is really looking at the inside out approach, like, you know, who is the being within um, which I guess opens up that whole frame of where is spirituality in in this education process. And I'd like to ask Namali about that. Where is spirituality in this whole education process? Where do you think it sits? Thank you for that question. And thank you, Hannah. I loved what, everything you said. And I think I can really resonate with a lot of your ideas um, on the three points and, and even the three um, thoughts that you'd have about a relationship between yourself and child. Um, I resonate with that as a head of a school where that connection between an educator and a child was so important for their personal growth. And I, I think I was quite a radical principal because I really couldn't care less about the curriculum <laughs> as much as I cared about uh, the personal growth of these children. And so I'd often take any opportunity um, to say, okay, how can this child learn from this particular experience? Maybe they're having a fight with their friends um, or they uh, are not really you know, disruptive in class, not interested in maths and so forth. Um, and it might indicate that you know, maybe they're just not a maths type of person, but they might be um, very passionate about a cause. Um, and so you might give them some sort of responsibility um, to handle the calculation of the amount of uh, provisions are going towards a particular beneficiary during a charitable event, for instance, or the number of trees being planted on a particular site when we're doing a tree planting activity. And then they, they really race towards that mass at that time. Um, so working with what interests the child to, to be able to have a teachable moment. Yeah. Um, but in terms of spirituality, I think, you know, uh, spirituality to me is part of that whole self of a person. 
Um, and everyone has it in some way, whether we ascribe to a religion or not. Uh, we have an essence, uh, a spiritual essence that longs for a higher purpose, that, that feels fulfillment um, and affirmation when we are um, aspiring towards a higher purpose in life. And uh, when we are connected with earth and connected with other people uh, and, and animals and uh, you know everything in the universe. And so that is part of being spiritual and part of spiritual growth is being able to understand yourself, to be able to reflect deeply about things in, in the universe, um, to be able to make sense of the universe as well in, in ways that provide meaning to you and to be able to have almost a divine connection to everything in your environment. Um, and, you know, the beautiful meditation we had earlier where you can float out of your physical self um, and enter a space of serenity and self-calm. A lot of these are life skills that ideally an, an educated person should be able to develop it within themselves, to be able to expand, to be able to cope with uh, the, the vicissitudes of life through expanding their self and through realizing that they're not just limited by this human con configuration of cells and, and you know body matter, uh, but they are so much more than that as well. And if we can see that in every child, that they're not just a child that's labeled with ADHD or uh, somebody on the autism spectrum um, or a child who is... Uh, you know, of this tribe or that race um, or that from that family background. They're not just those labels, but they are a whole spiritual being uh, that is beautiful and has inner worth and value and so much to contribute to this universe. Otherwise, they wouldn't be here. And so to help that person find their calling, their, to reconnect with their spiritual self is part of the whole a process of, of a lifelong education, lifelong growth, and part of the transformative experience of education, ideally. Um, and so for us, uh, you know, we often say in many cultures, raising a child takes, it, it takes a village to raise a child. You can't just do it uh, on your own. Whether you're a parent or a teacher, we put so much pressure on teachers in our contemporary education system puts so much pressure on them. Teachers are among the most stressed out people on the planet. They have just way too much pressure on them. Whether they're experienced for 20 years as a teacher or they're just coming into teaching from graduate school, uh, there is still so much pressure on them to work within a system that expects conformity, expects you to see uh, learners as uh, measurements, you know, mm -hmm. subjects mm -hmm. that can be measured. Um, and in that way, doesn't it tend to the wholeness of a being? It like doesn't. Whole student or the wholeness of yourself as a teacher? Absolutely. Your, your value as a spiritual entity is completely dismissed, right? It's not even acknowledged. Yeah. Um, your ability to think for yourself and to challenge, well, you know, does this make sense to me? Uh, is it real? How do I know it's true? Um, you should be able to engage in those reflective questions as a spiritual and being. Natural faculties of being a human being. Like, just you know, the exercise your judgment in a circumstance rather than going, am I allowed to do this? What is the policy on the behavior management? Am I, what did someone, what did, I had a situation, at, I was casual teaching on Friday and there was literally a situation where it was a rainy day, the wet weather song came on, all the kids came flooding in. And of course, there are these rambunctious teenage boys who want to play tips. So of course, they're running up and down the corridor. One teacher says, no, I didn't know they'd already said that. I knew running inside wasn't a thing, but I say, okay, can we do stealth tip? They're like, I'm down with that, miss. Okay, fist bump, off they go. But then another teacher comes back and was like, no, they're just trying to get out of it. And no, go outside or don't like they, you know, this kind of like, oh, it was messy. When you're trying to, when you when you don't have space to use, it's interesting actually. When you don't have space to use your whole being and to uh, apply your yeah. natural faculties of discernment, of appropriateness to the moment, to the child, to the need, to the like, what we wanted the outcome of that moment to be, things just get messy. And Gabrielle, you know, I will. I was thinking as Namali was talking, of course, like, just you're so beautifully articulate. I'm so glad you joined us for this conversation. Um, 
you know, but I was thinking back to that question you asked of me in at the beginning, you know, like what are some of these like factors that are contributing to these socioeconomic mess and, and how and the situation and how those socioeconomic factors are contributing to the mess and the decline of learning outcomes and that kind of thing, the crisis that has been identified in education. I think if I go back to that um, like ecosystem analogy, imbalance, Mm, I think you kind of answered it, yeah. If Mm. if all we do is attend to part of our humanity, um, our capacity to be disciplined and listen to rules and and obey and whatever, we become Muppets who are like caged tigers, you know, rattling and and pacing and things and just, you know, bazoozoo in the head. And I'm thinking of kids actually in the schooling system who are just so sick of being forced to conform. And why do we want them to conform to what, for whose benefit? And if we bring it back also to that thing of how can people in general contribute, it's to re to help reorientate young people's thinking around what's important. Yes, why do you need to study right now? Maybe not for the test, but maybe to practice that to, to develop the muscle of applying yourself, of being someone who completes things. Like, you know, me, I always have a million ideas and how much would I have achieved in my life by now if I had completed even half the ideas I've had, you know? Um, helping them, it's not just about getting good marks, not just about measuring them. It's not just about um, you've got to get a job one day. You know, some of the common rhetoric that we throw out about what education is there's so much more to the picture of, I think every single one of us, and I'm sure our listeners would agree, what we what we want for young people, not just from them. Mm. And if we can reorientate p- people to think about those other aspects, we can nurture a whole being more effectively in support of the formal schooling system, which does in the reality of our world, provide qualifications that enable them to move into the world of work more it's the way the system is right now so let's we'll kind of also find a way to work with it maybe rather than against it yes and i think I'm, in line of that is this idea that you know we're we're um, we, we're living in an information age and children already have access to a lot of information so when we talk about education as a transformative experience an expansive spirit experience something that helps a young person to grow we can help to empower them to, you know, whether you're an auntie or an uncle or a, a parent or a neighbor, um, any young person around you, all it takes to support them is really just to understand them as a person, to value them as a person with all their eccentricities. Um, it makes them who they are and they're special for that. Um, and not to see them as, okay, why isn't this person like that other person? Why isn't this child the same as you know, this other person, we tend to do a lot of social comparison. That's really demoralizing for children. If we can accept them as unique, special human beings on their own, there's, these are spiritual beings in a, in a human body, um, but they're, they're, they have inherent value on their own. And they're here on this planet to be able to fulfill their purpose. What, how can I be part of the growth of this person to be able to fulfill their life calling? What can I do in terms of helping that person uh, develop their own interests or be able to exercise something, um, a muscle that they're interested in exercising, whether it's a creativity muscle or a, you know, a passion for a cause. It's really just about getting behind that child and helping them to practice their um, themselves, expanding themselves. And in doing so, the neural connections inside their brains allow them to expand in many other aspects of their life too. So, you know, these things happen at an es- esoteric level. You don't necessarily need to teach a person uh, X, Y, and Z in something in a particular subject in order for them to expand in that subject. Sometimes it just means giving a person a a way to be to explore um, and exercise their passions and in doing that they also suddenly improve in another area as well because everything is interconnected um, so it's yeah, really yeah. just about looking for how can I support this young person in mm. their interest their growth how can I maybe give them a, a larger perspective or give them a, an exposure to something bigger that they're interested in 
um, and then let them navigate through those things and ma make those personal con connections inside their mind and be able to reflectively expand themselves and just be there to love and support that person as they're thinking things through. And sometimes in conversations, a young person will say something snappy and we just shut them down because we think, oh, that's nonsense or that's too extreme. Uh, but, you know, they're just reflecting. They're in that process of exploring who they are, what their thoughts are. Um, and so we, we need to give us a, a space, a safe space for them to explore their thoughts um, and, you know, developing themselves as well. So I think that's really important as elders around young people. And, you know, if I, I think about it in the context of today's world, um, that kind of enabling is is really critical, isn't it? Like, I mean, if I consider that next week, um, uh, the, you know, the 2023 UN Climate Change Conference is going to be convened in Dubai, 30th of November to, I think it's the 12th of December. Um, and, you know, we're global negotiators and global citizens will, you know, once again, deliberate and strategize with each other to address the stark global reality. And, you know, also in our world at the moment, there's two significant wars raging um, with devastating global impact, the war in Ukraine and Gaza. And, um, and this is the context that we're educating young people today and children um, and, you know, in some places, girls are not allowed to be educated legally or socially. They're not, ac no access to education. So you look at these sort of contexts, um, the, the generation of um, global citizens presently in secondary schools and in primary schools is a generation that's going to face squarely the impact of, um, of climate change and global wars and illiteracy because you're not even allowed access to education. So... I'm going to finish with a question in that kind of context, and I haven't even drawn the full context of what's happening in our world presently, but you know, just two factors there. I'm going to finish by asking you to just both of you to say um, maybe just in a minute or so, so it's a summary kind of question, how can education be transformed to enable a loving world? Big question. What would be one thing, just one thing that you would do to tweak things in the education system to enable a loving world? I, I think that we need to model what we'd like to see in others. And so if we want to create a loving world, an accepting world, a world of diversity, of opportunity, um, where everybody is equal and free, then we need to also imbibe that in our own lives um, as well as in our relationships with other people including the young people in our schools to enable them with love support the freedom to explore themselves um, and to be able to to navigate important decisions through conversation dialogues and reflections so we can also help them with with calming um, reflective strategies as well to be able to navigate life. Um, but we can't just teach that as an instructional thing. We need to model that in ourselves as well. So we as elders, we, we've messed up this planet. I think a lot of young people are calling our generations out for what we have done. Um, and we need to reflect on that ourselves and say, well, wait a minute, maybe you're right. Uh, maybe we have made a mess of things. And maybe we do need to also take a good look at ourselves and see how we can also make some changes here. Mali, thank you. What about you, Hannah? I started with something that's not a tweak and I've downscaled it. So I'm going to give you both. <laughs> I think this is not, a. the first answer is not a tweak. It's a massive overhaul. And I think we need to remove all forms of com competitive measurement. We need to delete PISA from national education priorities um, and any form of local um, competitive measurement, like anything that um, in terms of assessment that ranks or rates people against each other, I think is a delete. Not a tweak, but that's one change. I think the other thing we need to do, and it's a little bit of a springboard off Namali, um, I think we need to 
help awaken empathy in young people by showing them that they matter. It is very hard to care about the world beyond yourself if your own heart is crumpled. If you feel compressed or suppressed as a person, and if you feel that the people in your social environment, whether at home, share house, friendship circle that you've chosen for yourself, colleagues, whatever, if you're in an environment where you are not valued or you are not valued in a way that helps you get it, like if we're talking, say, five love languages kind of stuff, if you don't get that you're valued, it is very hard to find strength in your heart to care about more than your dishes, if that. Um, and if we want a loving world, then we need to help people's hearts come, people live in the world from a place of overflow, and so maybe two things to that. There's an A and a B. And the A is we need to help p- relate to people as though they matter. And the second is to, I think, through meditation, enable people to create um, a connection with a supreme being, um, which Namali pointed us to very wisely, so that people also know how to return. Have like it, It's like, you know, the internal muscle, And then society becomes the gym where they can work their internal muscles. So it's kind of uh, dual forces. Like I'm filling my cup and I have an environment that reinforces my my effort and my capacity and my strength to fill my own cup and to stay full and give back. And yeah, I think that's. A rich conversation, a rich conversation indeed. Namali, really big thanks to you. And Hannah, big thanks to you as well. I've, um, I love the insights that you've shared and the experiences that you've shared um, in your learning journey as educators and in your learning journey personally. And, um, and the depth of spiritual insights you've brought to our conversation too. So a very big thanks to both of you. And, um, and may I wish you well. Big blessings for your journey ahead, um, making huge contributions to our world as global citizens and uh, blessings from the universe team that it continues. So our big thanks to you both tonight. Thank you. Thank Thank you you to everyone on the universe team and to all your beautiful listeners as well. It's been a pleasure to be here, to expand myself as well. Thank you. Thank you, Hannah. I love you. You know that. (laughs) Yeah, 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 yeah. Coffee and sticky day pudding soon. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, okay. really, yeah, thank you again for the opportunity to bring the, the topic of education back to the table I think it is yeah, such a good topic and I'm sure we're going to be engaging with it again it's such a vital aspect of our of um of our journey our journey in life to becoming who we really are fully mm. okay thanks so much um, viewers, you might like to browse our online bookshop, Eternity Inc., which has a full range of online books um, and, that, and products that you can buy on self-empowerment and inner powers and so on, and always at not-for-profit prices. And with the festive season coming up, it might be something that you'd like to treat your friends, your loved ones, a gift from Eternity Inc. And if you'd like to subscribe to Open Your Eyes to the Universe, to receive monthly updates, please email us at special.events at au.brahmakamaris.org. And for 2023, this is our final episode of Open Your Eyes to the Universe. We'll be back with you in January 2024. So please join us on Saturday, the 27th of January 2024, for our first episode of the season. And as usual, it'll be at our regular time, 6 p.m. AEDT. And as we close out tonight, we'll be listening to Wild Sweet by Starling Arrow from their album Cradle. So until we see you again online on 27 January 2024, enjoy the festive season. However you choose to spend it, take care, stay safe and walk lightly on the earth. Om Shanti.